In the year 2000, Games Workshop released a specialist game known as War Master. Although set in the Warhammer Fantasy setting, War Master differed in rule set and one even more apparent way. The models were at a shockingly tiny 10 mm scale, less than one third of the size of a typical 40K in Age of Sigmar model that we see used today. And even though the Warmaster line has been out of production for more than a decade, I tracked one down to see what kind of self-inflicted torture I could impose painting one of these tiny, tiny men. Welcome back, friends. When my buddy Sam gifted me one of these tiny Warmaster figures a while ago, I thought he was playing a prank on me. I mean, there's no way that a model this tiny could even be seen at the table when you're playing a game with it. Is that my cavalry? Nope, just a Cheeto crumb. And I've got to imagine that painting these things is equally as ridiculous, but I'm a glutton for punishment. So today I'm going to attempt to paint one and see how difficult it really is and if there's anything to be learned from painting a miniature the size of an ant. I started by putting our Bretonian crossbowman, 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 crossbowman on a 25 millimeter base, which makes it look like he's sitting on a damn dinner plate, but it's the smallest size base I have, so we're gonna have to live with it. After slapping some fine texture paste on the base, I go about priming him black and mentally prepare myself for squinting at tiny details until I go cross-eyed. Oh, it happened. It happened. As I begin to paint the face, I'm realizing how difficult it is to pick out details on this model. I definitely would have benefited from a white zenithal prime from above, but I'm stubborn, so I'll just complain about it instead of actually breaking my airbrush back out. Once I put a wash of Reichland Flesh Shade on the skin, I can see this guy has actually some pretty damn good details sculpted in. Props to the sculptor for doing that at such a tiny scale. He even has what I think are upper eyelids on his face, but that could have just been a stray cat hair that got stuck on the mini. I'm thinning my paint down quite a bit here because I'm relying on a small, sharp brush to put the paint just where I want it. And if the paint isn't thinned down with at least two to one water to paint, I'm just not gonna have a nice smooth flow off the tip of the brush. All of the standard miniature paint I'm using to paint this mini will be pro acryl because a lot of paints really lose their opacity quickly when you thin them down this much. And I really don't want to be doing four to five coats on every tiny little surface just to reach full vibrancy. And pro acryl will hold its power even when I thin it down. I'm mixing olive flesh in with my base coat of tan flesh to start with some highlights on the face. And there's not a lot of area to build up highlights here, but I'm trying my best to hit the eyelids, the brow line, the nose, and the cheekbones. And with a little patience, a little practice, and a very sharp brush, I found that this actually wasn't as difficult as I had expected. What I found works best is just barely tapping the model with the tip of the brush or having very, very faint brush strokes that are barely touching the model. So just a little bit of thin paint goes just where you want it. After the final highlight of pure olive flesh just on the tip of the nose and cheekbones, I think the skin still looks a little bit flat, so let's bring back some shadows and tone with warmth with a thin glaze of burnt red. The red is mixed very thinly with about 10 parts water to one part paint, and you don't wanna have very much on your brush so you can still control it. Now to prevent 100 questions in the comments on what kind of brush I use to paint this guy, I use a Monument Hobbies Sable size zero. I found that it is a nice, sharp, and very controllable brush, and it has just enough firmness to it that I can hit all the points I want without the brush going floppy. I typically use their size three for most miniature painting because it also has a very sharp tip but a nice large belly so I can store a lot of moisture and paint while I'm going through a larger surface. And if you wanted to pick up one of these brushes or any paint or even the all important sexy gogs or anything else that I'm using in today's video, you can check the link below for all my affiliate links and you can save some money on your purchases and you support me to make more videos. I decided our crossbowman needs a nice vibrant color scheme. Not only will this stay true to the Bretonian lore and what these knights look like, I think, but it also allows the model to stand out from a distance so we can actually see it from further than six inches away. One of the most difficult things I found to pull off in this paint job is to try to keep a tiny black line of primer still visible where materials meet. 
This will help keep things visually crisp and clean. Trying to go through and blackline everything afterwards is a suicide mission, and there's no way I'm doing that. Building up from burnt red to the super vibrant, bold pyro red over a few steps is important. If I go right into the super bright red, I can't really maneuver my highlights in any way without adding white or yellow to them to make them turn pink or orange. But this coat and hat does take up a large portion of the model, so I wanna take my time and build up depth and have enough layers of that pure bold red so it really pops and read as vibrant red. But it still is important, especially on these tiny models, to have some crisp edge highlights where you can. So I did add a little bit of bold titanium white to my pyro red to add the final crisp edge highlights where I thought they needed to be to help the model stand out. And I couldn't help but draw attention to this progressive fashion statement our crossbowman is making here. He took his doublet and he ripped off one of the sleeves so you could see his poofy pirate shirt underneath. And also, he's wearing tights, but one of the legs of the tights is actually floppy shorts. So this is, this is all new level of fashion. To sell this shirt as linen, the most important thing to do is to use a warm shadow color and build it back up with warm off-whites. I'm using ivory, and for the final highlights, I mix in a bit of pure white. But I am keeping the leg that's wearing shorts a brighter white, because I want that to have a stark contrast to the black stripes I'll be adding to it. Painting pinstripes on a tiny man's two millimeter long shorts seemed like a great idea, but once I actually had the paint on my brush and I went to apply it, it no longer felt like such a brilliant idea. But if you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. And I'm not sure how that applies here, but there's a life lesson in there somewhere. The key is to keep your paint as thin as you can, so it will smoothly and easily leave your brush, but not so thin that it doesn't cover well at all. And that's part of the reason I painted the pants white first. Black over white covers so much easier than vice versa. I start with one thin vertical line, and then I fatten that line on each side, trying to make sure the edges are nice and crisp. If you screw this up, it's gonna suck trying to reestablish that clean white after. So just do it perfect the first time and everything will be fine. Today's video is brought to us by the number one place that us creative types go to get our learn on, Skillshare. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of inspiring classes for creators. Explore new skills, deepen existing passions, and go down the rabbit hole of artistic enlightenment. There's tons of applicable classes for our mini hobby artsy related things regarding color, light, and even artist productivity. One I'm excited to start is called Productivity for Creatives, building a system that brings out your best with Thomas Frank. Lord knows I struggle to make the most out of my hobby time. Skillshare is great because it's curated specifically for learning, meaning there's no ads, they're always launching new high quality classes by people that know their stuff, and the classes are broken up into bite-sized chunks so you can learn whenever you have some free time, over lunch, on the toilet, on a hot air balloon ride, wherever. If you wanna figure out if it's something that you would like or not, why don't you click on the link in the video description below and get a one month free trial. That way you can cater for a spin, but it's only open to the first 1000 subscribers that click that link. So get on down there and enjoy your free trial. A big thank you to Skillshare for supporting the channel. Now let's get these minis put away and get back to the video. To continue the theme of this bright outfit, I decided that his pant leg that's wearing tights will be a bright yellow. It's best to start off with a darker, nicely pigmented color, like a golden brown or a burnt orange when building up to pure yellow. Not only will it help you cover better, but it's also a great shadow tone to give your final yellow color some depth. As I'm painting on this yellow, I realize that there's not really any sculpted details of where the tights end and the boots begin. So maybe I should have just painted them all yellow, like he's just wearing a onesie and no boots at all. Yeah, in hindsight, that would have looked way cooler. Yellow acrylic paint tends to have pretty poor coverage in general, even less so when you thin it down for a smooth coat applied with a tiny brush. So don't think that you're doing anything wrong or that your paint is terrible if it takes quite a few coats to get that pure bright yellow you're looking for. Just keep at it. I used eight or so layers on the tips of his knees because I knew they would need to be the brightest. 
I want this ridiculously large floppy feather that's on his hat to also be white, but I want it to be different than the white of his shirt. So we're going to start with a cooler color as opposed to a warmer one and build back up to that pure white. One important tip while painting a cool white is to not just add more white paint as you build up your highlights. Often this will make the surface read as pale blue instead of white. I just add a touch of black to desaturate my gray blue first, and then I add in more and more white. This cuts back on some of that blue tone while still feeling like a natural transition up to pure white for our brightest highlights. Painting the crossbow itself requires me to make some decisions on which surfaces are which material because there's not a lot of clean differentiation. I decided that I was going to keep the stock and body of the crossbow to be wood and the prod to be metal. I had to Google that. The prod is the metal boingy thing that shoots the bolts. There's not a lot of space to add much detail on this wood, but with some thin paint that I used to edge highlight, I attempted to add some texture and grain and age to the wood. And for the final edge highlights, I kept them a bit jagged and not a clean line to imply imperfections in the wood that would catch various amounts of light. And if I'm so stupid to try to do pinstripes on those tiny, tiny shorts, then I think I should do non-metallic metal on this tiny crossbow, right? No, I shouldn't do that. That's a terrible idea. But I figure if I can pull off that tiny blend on here, then I should be able to paint anything metallic, right? Sure. Let's go with that. The approach I'm taking is called loaded brush, and this technique really deserves a dedicated video of its own, and I'll get to that soon, I promise. We're going to take a thin down blue-black into the belly of the brush, and a dot of thick, heavy body titanium white on the tip of the brush. By applying the white on the tip of the brush first, and then slowly swiping the brush back and forth, we can blend the wet paint right on the mini. This is a very tough technique to learn even on a normal size mini, and I definitely struggled here. But I think that after a couple of attempts on a couple different areas, it turned out okay. It's important to have dots and jagged edge highlights of that pure titanium white, to have the material read as metal, and it really needs that glint of final brightness. Our final steps are going to be around the base of this model. Like I said, it seems kind of big for him, so I can't make it too small and boring. The first thing I'm going to do is mix three different browns right on the base itself. Just wet blend them all around. This is a good practice for you as you're learning wet blending. And don't worry about it being perfectly smooth or having full coverage. Then we take a thin down olive green to a wash consistency and place it on a few select places around the base to give some hint that there's some vegetation growing there. Next, we'll take a khaki color and do a quick dry brush to pick out all that nice texture on the base. And then we'll wash down the entire base with Agrax Earthshade to bring all of our colors back together and add some shadows around that texture we just highlighted. Next, we're gonna take some of this clump foliage that any model train supplier worth their salt will carry, and we're gonna mix it directly on the palette with some water, with some green paint, and some PVA glue. This gives us a bit more color depth and variation to the foliage, and it allows it to stick directly down to the base, and the paint melds it naturally into the environment. Next, open up a tea bag that your grandma left for you in her will and put a little bit of watered down PVA glue right on the base and sprinkle some of this down there for some two scale leaves and debris. And I got this awesome moss stuff that I've been meaning to try out some more. So I put some of that down in the few spots on the base and used some water to feather out the edges so it didn't give us a coffee stained look. This stuff dries matte and gets more and more vibrant the more layers you put on. So you can build up the layers more and more if you'd like to for a more dramatic effect. We're almost done with this base, I promise. Next, I'm gonna take some grass tufts and I'm gonna cut them up into smaller irregular shapes and super glue those right on the base. I find that this looks way more natural and less weird and awkward that all the grass in this fantasy world is all in perfect little circles. 
And the final step of this unnaturally long basing section for painting this teeny tiny man is to put down a few different colored pigments on the base and smush them in to give some color variation and some finish variation to the environment. And just like that, I can say that I've painted my first, and probably not my last, 10 millimeter War Master figure. Now, to give you a true scale of how tiny this dude really is, let's show him on the screen next to some other minis, so you see which mini is the most mini of all the minis. I do think that painting this guy did actually help me practice my detail work. And that stuff applies to any miniature you paint, whether it's eyes, fine details, edge highlighting, or something more advanced like freehanding. Painting it at a 32 millimeter or larger scale suddenly doesn't feel so daunting now that I've done it at a 10 millimeter scale. Thanks for hanging out with me today. I'm curious if any of you are going to follow my lead and try this 10 millimeter painting challenge. It will put you to the test for sure. And there are some awesome War Master models out there you can find on eBay. Also, have any of you tried any other unconventional painting techniques just to try to improve your painting in a not so traditional way? Put those down in the comments section below. I'm curious what other kinds of weird things people do to try to improve their miniature painting. And maybe I'll try one of those out next time. If you do enjoy this unabashedly weird miniature painting YouTube channel, and you want to support it, the main way that you could do that would be to check out the Patreon link in the video description below. It's because each month those amazing patrons support me that I can do this full time and really put everything I can into improving and making more and better YouTube videos. So until next time, get out there and slay just a little bitty bit of gray. Paste on the base. Paste on the paste, the paste, the paste, paste. Base. I forgot what I was going to say next. Quickly, when you thim dim down, thim dim down, thim dim 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 dim. One of my lights just went out back there, so this is completely professional. Pay no mind. This is rambling. I'm rambling.